What is going on, everybody? Thank you all so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Mi Casa es Su Casa on American Freedom Radio. And as usual, I am your host, Nico House. Uh, I do want to thank American Freedom Radio as usual. It is always fun being on. And uh, if you have not... If you have not, make sure you go follow them on Twitter. Make sure you follow them on Facebook. Uh, and go check out some of the other extraordinary shows that they have as well. I mean, you know, I love my show, but it's always nice to go check out. Have some diversity in your woke opinions, right? Um, even though most of us are on the same page, we all do cover different topics that are just as necessary. Um, so definitely go follow them if you have not. Secondly... Uh, I do want to encourage you all, if you have not, to join us on Just Inform. Uh, come join us with this evolution of social media that we've started. You can do so by going to justinform.com. J-U-S-T-N-F-O-R-M. Mm, let me get some water. <laughs> uh, wow. Mm. What a week last week, right? Had some crazy victories. There were actually two major victories that were not, one of them was not discussed as much though. So obviously everybody at this point probably has heard about the uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez victory. A uh, young woman from the Bronx uh, who beat Joe Crowley, who was the supposedly going to be the next leader, House Majority Leader for the Democratic Party which was huge. It was actually totally unexpected, but she did it. Now, there was another pretty big victory for progressives, and that was the victory that was had by Benjamin Jealous, former, well, I guess he doesn't like to go by former activist, but he's still an activist. Current activist, uh, the very first endorsement ever of Dave Chappelle, because he said that Ben Jealous, he feels, is the only guy only politician that he has ever been able to trust, ever. So, uh, that's big news. Uh, we're going to talk about both of those in a second. Uh, also, we're going to cover the North Korea deal that kind of almost didn't get... Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens, right? I'm going to talk about that too. That's it. You're going to get really frustrated when I talk about that particular topic because the hypocrisy, the glaring hypocrisy of the establishment left when it comes to the North Korea deal and even some of the right is just disgusting. It's it's bad, people. So, uh, yeah. What else we got today? Oh, huh, kind of a big deal. Iran, right? The conflict in Iran has jumped up. The protests have increased. And so now we have to figure out whether or not it's just another attempt from America to overthrow a regime that won't do what we want. And I want to give you a hint. Yeah, yeah, it is another attempt. Okay, it is. <laughs> Anticlimactic, but nonetheless... Um, I didn't want to leave you hanging for too long there, right? So, um, Alexandra Ocasio, I have been doing my best, my absolute best to keep up with all of the craziness following her election. Um, first and foremost, I want to say congratulations. That is a magnificent achievement to be able to unseat someone like Joe, Joe Crowley, who has been in charge of that particular district for uh, 20 years through 10 elections. That's a generation. She was eight years old when Joe Crowley got elected. Isn't that insane? So congratulations, Alexandria. Um, I mean, us progressives and even some of the right I've heard are, are just very proud uh, because I, as my friend Lee Stranahan said, uh, Lee is a conservative and he said, you know what? I almost agree platform wise with almost nothing 
with almost literally nothing of what she has to say policy wise but I do know that she wants peace and I do know that she's not corruptible uh, and that's and that's good enough for me that's good enough for me we can get to the to the you know single payer versus uh, private health care we can get to the the you know food assistance versus you know a little far less food assistance we can get to the immigration issues but all of those issues are really minuscule in when being compared to the rampant corruption uh, in both parties in this non-stop for-profit war machine war machine excuse me that is the military industrial complex so um congratulations and, and and i hope that you remain uncorrupted as you have been thus far uh so a lot of people wonder how ocasio won and it's important to know how she won because there are going to be a lot of people throwing you a lot of bs at you like they're going to be throwing you nonsense after bs claim after break break bark proven bullshit Oh my goodness! Breitbart tried to spread a rumor about her, and the New York Times just ate it up. The uh, the CNN at one point I think even ate it up. Uh, Daily Mail over at the UK they ate it up, um, and it's not really tr- it's so factually like as far as there are some facts in the article that are true about the general like the general I guess vicinity of where she lived at at one point but that's pretty much it but the, there is an assertion that Ocasio would have never been allowed to win if she uh, if she was playing for the right team or if she wasn't playing for the right team and I would tend to agree with these people 99.9999 well not even 99 95 well really 91 because now we've seen the numbers improve that money has only been affecting elections and 91 percent of the uh elections instead of what it used to be which is 97 so believe it or not that's actually a stark improvement which is good right so whereas usually like i said i would agree with these people i really would but there's there's something to be said as to why I don't necessarily get my uh, my knowledge or my logic from people who are purely pundits, from people who merely pontificate from behind a desk or a counter or a camera or their social media platforms. You know the Fox News of the world, the CNNs of the world, even some independent journalists who try to figure out the temperature of the room by sticking their finger in the air and seeing which way the wind blows. That can get really dangerous because, well, social media is manipulated, right? We know that. Uh, Establishment news anchors and, and these reporters and these, I don't know if you want to call them journalists, but some of these journalists have have been co-opted and they man, their job is to manipulate you and I. Now, what makes myself different? What makes people like Tim Black different? Even Jimmy Dore, uh, Lee Camp, um, Fiorella, and Craig of the Convo Couch, um, BC DeGraft, who's in charge of the he, he's responsible for the Rigged series. Even Garland Nixon and Lee Stranahan. Garland Nixon being progressive and Lee Stranahan being Republican, uh, Ocasio herself. The thing that makes us different is that we're we're we have what I like to call well, it's a term used in hip hop and it's a term often used in the hood. We say it's called putting your ear to the streets. You got to keep your ears to the streets. Now, what does that mean? That means when I have a question about Ocasio, do you think I call the New York Times? Or I pull up an article about New York, and not because this is different, right? So we know that Ocasio is an activist, so it's not the same as looking up somebody like Kamala, 
It doesn't take much to find out what Kamal's about. She has all the numbers, right? All the all the proof in her past, which shows that evidentially uh, she is not for us. She's not a progressive. She's not for the black community. She's not for women's rights. She's not for any of the things that she supposedly has discovered that she is about when she wants to run for office and got the go ahead from all the Clinton donors. She's not about that. But Ocasio is different, right? Because we don't have a, a, a big glaring glance into her past that will let us know whether she's easily co-opted. We don't know if she could be, uh, if she's really establishment and maybe she's undercover for, you know, there's like, there's so many things uh, that we don't, we can't just merely figure out from reading the New York Times or reading Breitbart or Fox News or whatever. So, you know what I do or what Tim Black would do or Jim Jimmy Dore for example, we start, we get on the phone. Uh, first person I called or I talked to about this was Craig Pasta, um, who is the host of the Convo Couch on my network, the MCSC network. Um, and he was in New York, believe it or not, for a funeral. And when he met this woman, he was so impassioned by her conviction for progressivism that he actually worked for her for a day while he was in New York. Um, that was supposed to be his vacation and he went to a funeral and he worked for her. And that was such a privilege for him. He, he was, he, I mean, couldn't stop talking about it when he came down and we did the California election together, uh, which is, which is, was, Craig is a very skeptical person so uh, he'll call a spade a spade, right? Uh, Craig and I don't see eye to eye on everything. Like, for example, he thinks that they should vote for Kevin DeLeon if it means getting Feinstein out in California, and I tend to disagree. But it's not like he is saying Kevin DeLeon is a progressive. He's just saying that Kevin DeLeon is a better option than Feinstein. Uh, and although I don't agree with that, at least he is very upfront. He's not going to call somebody a progressive if they're not a progressive, and he just feels like the politics in California are much different. So I can respect his opinion because of the logic behind it. He's not being deceptive about it, I guess is what you're saying. So with this situation, for him to have been all in on Ocasio when he was skeptical about some of the progressives that ran in California, but he was all in on Ocasio, so that was a big deal for me. I caught another friend of mine who met Ocasio personally. Uh, they had an event in California, a very progressive event for Bernie Sanders supporters. And they said that the moment that they heard Ocasio speak, which, you know, Ocasio was very modest. She wasn't dressed up. She wasn't in like a $100,000 outfit. <laughs> she wasn't in none of, any of that type of stuff. She was, she was, just a, you know, at that time, 27 year old progressive doing something that seemed unattainable, something that trying to conquer a victory uh, that seemed unachievable at the time. But she did it. Did anybody think she would win at that point? Probably not. But she said that Ocasio is a real deal. She said Ocasio is just, there was just something about her. Right, so I said okay. My my supporters on social media even started to DM me about her. Like you need to keep an eye out on this girl. She is making a lot of progressive waves, and y'all are surprised about by what she did with the establishment. I, however, am not all that surprised because early on, well, maybe not early on. I would say about halfway through, I had people in New York contacting me saying. Hey, uh, we think that Ocasio is scaring the establishment. She's actually scaring them. They're starting that there they may there may be a debate with Crowley and Ocasio. And I was like, there's no way in hell, people. That doesn't happen. Like Crowley would never have debated Ocasio if he didn't if he didn't see that she was becoming an imminent threat. Because it wasn't the first debate between them. It was supposed to be a debate earlier and he was so fearful or or at least he wanted to 
show that he refuses to acknowledge her, that he's actually sent a young woman to debate her instead, which is obviously like a big deal because it's like, wow, you won't even, you won't even like acknowledge her presence as a candidate. Okay, that's very respectful, right? Very commendable behavior from Crowley. But, so all these people are telling me about Ocasio. And they're saying, and you know, I started doing my research on the district as well as, you know, other people doing the same thing, you know, me, my contacts. And we're like, holy crap, she could actually win this election. Yes, demographics are important. But also, this is why it's important to, in, in today's world of journalism, there are a lot of people that will feed you Ben Shapiro, like Ben Shapiro. Now, what people don't know, if you don't know by now, my new word for bullshit is Ben Shapiro, because uh, it's the initials of BS, and Ben Shapiro is the biggest bullshitter on the right that I have ever seen, because he portrays himself as being like the sane version of Alex Jones uh, for the establishment right, and which is actually really scary, because people actually believe him. So... Ben Shapiro is full of Ben Shapiro. He's a, he's a BSer. Um, but yeah, there's Ben Shapiro's of the world who uh, would convince you that this is an anomaly. And it really wasn't. But these pundits like Ben Shapiro, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, even Mike Cernovich, like. I don't, I'm not attacking him, but Kyle Kalinske, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, when I say I'm, I'm not attacking him, I'm just saying, like, it's hard to get a feel for what the community, the political community wants and what the political environment feels like at the time without being there, without responding to those DMs, without making those phone calls with people who don't have hundreds of thousands of followers or tens of thousands of followers. You have to be willing to go, like it's, I guess it's called outreach. And I know it works because Jimmy Dore does this and look at his support because he's right. He, he knows he can get a feel for what people believe because he's responding to people on Twitter. He's you know engaging with people. Uh, Ron Placone, same thing. Ron Placone makes it a point to go out and, and engage with these activists in California. Ron Placone is Jimmy Dore's uh, partner on the Jimmy Dore show. Same thing with Miserable Liberal. Uh, Tim Tim Black goes out, and he was at the Ben Jealous rally. He goes to these events in D.C. Uh, obviously, you know I do the same. I'm actually going to uh, Tim Canova's event on July 4th in the morning, talking to these progressives. I'm talking to the candidates so they know how progressives feel about them. Like, that's what, that type of of engagement is in my humble opinion. That That's what should, those people should be your authority on whether or not something is legitimate. The fact that Kyle Kalinske and TYT thinks that Ro Khan is a progressive shows they don't have their ear to the streets. Right? That's what that means. The fact that the mainstream media thinks that Ocasio came out of literally nowhere shows they don't have their ear to the streets. They are asking her, if you go, look look at some of the interviews on CNN and MSNBC and, and The View and, and even Stephen Colbert. You Are you not listening to the litany of questions they're proposing there? Like, asking her about everything because they don't know her but they do know this as far as their identity politics game is concerned Ocasio is young Latina born in the Bronx and she's a Democrat and she would be the youngest person ever to sit in the House of Representatives and I believe if I am not mistaken, if I am not mistaken, she would be the first Bronx native to actually be a U.S. Congress person. Um, like, 
actual native. Like that's where she she was. She did live in Westchester County uh, to go to school. Like, cause the Bronx school system was just abysmal, thanks to our elected officials. <laughs> um, and then she moved into a house later on. Her dad became an architect, and they got a three bedroom house out in Westchester County. Uh, but like. If you look at her biography, she spent a lot of her time going back and forth between Westchester and the Bronx because of her family. You know, they helped take care of her when she was young. So, and to be, the, I think she would be the first Puerto Rican. No, I think they're, no, well, technically, I guess she wouldn't be the first Puerto Rican because I believe they have a Puerto Rican Congress person. I think they are represented if, if their opinion actually gets valued, unfortunately. Sometimes that doesn't happen when you have such a small stake. Well, yeah, they have a grand stake in our election, but the U.S. doesn't take them, always take them seriously because of how ineffective they are, are in, in influencing anything. That's why they get taken advantage of so much. But anyway, I don't think she would be the first Puerto Rican, but I think she would be the first Bronx native, and she absolutely would be the youngest congressperson in history people in history insane right now once again these people are talking to me they're like there's going to be a low voter turnout usually low voter turnouts favor the incumbent if you know how the Bronx works if you know how Puerto Ricans in the Bronx work if you know how you know people in Queens like in when you live in a building, you talk to people, right? And in the Bronx specifically, if you're talking about people from the projects, <laughs> people, pretty much if you're in the projects and you're in the building, like my family, my family still lives in one of the project buildings in the Bronx. They have their cousins who have been living there their entire lives, you know, and their neighbors are family members, you know, their na their neighbor down the hall has two, you know their aunts and their uncles and their grandparents living in the same building. There are people who lived in these buildings for literally years or like, I mean, generations. I mean, like, and so granted you can call identity politics. You can call it whatever it is when they have a chance to put a young woman who's been dedicated to their community via activism and, and their, her dad being from that area uh, and her as well. Usually they pretty much reach a consensus she knocks on enough doors and it's not like it's hard to knock on every door in the building in the Bronx. Believe it or not. Like, it's, it's, it's not. You go floor to floor, take the elevator, assuming that the elevator is working. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's not as difficult as you would think, people. It just really isn't. And so with the low voter turnout, That particular situation where Crowley doesn't even live in the Bronx. Crowley is, has been known to be a little corrupt. Just a little bit. And where Ocasio is tied in to the community. It's not unbelievable that she won. In fact, there are some people that believe because of the strength of her ground game combined with the demographics... That it was almost an inevitability because Crowley slacked off so hard in the beginning thinking that he could spend money to beat someone from the hood. <laughs> and that's very hard to do. It's very difficult to do. Now, there's been a lot of slander about Ocasio. There's been a lot of misrepresentation about her values. Uh, and I want to clarify that. I want to try to, I'm trying to get her on the show soon to clarify that as well. I just reached out to her campaign manager today and I reached out to a couple of other people. I, ooh, ha, that's funny. Um, I just got an email from her communications director. <laughs> uh, or, Anyway, so it's not true 
it, 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 most of the stuff that they're saying about her is not true. She's not been co-opted, okay? Not yet. Maybe she can be. I don't know that for sure. Nobody can say that. Um, but she's not been um, she's not been co-opted at all, and people mistake her being on mainstream media for like because the next, the very very next day she was on everything. Oh my goodness. I was so happy for her because I mean being the being from a background very similar to Ocasio's uh where my mom eventually I mean we lived in a community we we lived in a very very poor area then because of the high school that my mom really really wanted us to go to we stayed in an area that was technically one of, if not the second most expensive area in all of Fayetteville, North Carolina, because it was the best high school in all of Fayetteville, North Carolina. You know, we're one of those high schools with multiple state championships and in, in several different sports, um, debate uh, and, and forensics stuff like, you know, speech and debate. We were one of the best in the country at that. Um, education, we were a school of choice. So yeah, when I say it was one of the most expensive areas in the, in the state or in the uh, area, then, but that doesn't mean that I was rich. Me and my brother were work. I was working from the time I was 15 years old. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, my mom will have to corroborate this for me because that was a long, whew, it was a long time ago. Um, I actually got my first job when I was 14, and I actually started working there. When I turn 15, I can actually get my permit. But like, I got the job first. And guess what? Half of my paycheck, it was McDonald's. Five twenty-five an hour. Five twenty-five people. <laughs> Half of my paycheck, every single paycheck. Uh went back to my household. When I got a better job, my check still went back to the household. My phone bill was always paid by myself. Like, whenever we had to, we would give up entire paychecks to our household. And, and, and Ocasio did the same thing. So, um, her being in West Tessa County in a house that was maybe, at the time, 90000 to to $100,000, uh, they're trying to say the average home is four four million dollars. They won't say what her house would actually be appraised for today because it's a three bedroom house. That I mean, it's cozy, okay. And this was twenty plus years ago that they moved into it, so it would not even be close to that. New York's real estate market has, I mean, good God, not I won't even say quadrupled, it quintupled. You know, it's it's not even the same as it used to be. So it's a, it's a smear tactic. But she goes on these mainstream media places and they literally knew nothing about her at all. At all. They know that her name is Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, that she's Puerto Rican, that she's lived in the Bronx, that she's running against Crowley. And then as they start asking her questions, they're like, oh shit, you're a democratic socialist? Oh, we, we didn't know that. Oh wait a minute! Uh, you you want universal single payer health care? Oh, we didn't know that either. Oh, you're gonna hold the Democrats accountable too? Oh wow, didn't know that either. Uh, you're gonna endorse Cynthia Nixon? Wow, okay. Uh, and they're figuring out this stuff as she goes. Their faces even look. They start to become frustrated because they're like, okay, maybe we should not have bought, brought her on. I want to point out a an interview that uh that they took that that happened on CNN. Well, see, yeah, CNN, and I wish I could remember that woman's name because I despise her. I despise her. Uh, but she was interviewing Ocasio, and she just kept trying to throw curveball after curveball after curveball after curveball. I've never seen someone, people. I've never seen CNN push this hard 
to figure out what a candidate stands for, right? Like legitimately asking hardball questions, but it was even worse than hardball. It was establishment, it was like establishment bias, hardball. So for example, they said, uh, we're glad you won, and Crawley was supposed to be, was, was potentially going to be the Speaker of the House, and, oh, by the way, huh, do you mind uh, saying that you're going to endorse Nancy Pelosi for the Leader of the House? And they're like, she's she like, uh, I don't think that we should be talking about that right now. I think we should observe, her, I mean, maybe if, if she earns it. But we should also keep our options open because we don't even know if we're going to have the house back in 2018 and 2020. So let's focus on winning elections. Boom. Dodged it. Then they were like, would you support the impeachment of Donald Trump? And she said, like, not because they asked her to push for it. Push for it. Would you support the impeachment of Donald Trump, people? She said, uh, yeah, under the emoluments clause. Now, I do want to clarify what the emoluments clause is because I've always said that if there was ever going to be an argument to impeach Trump, that this would be the only legitimate argument you can make. But because of that, there will not be an argument made for this by Congress because then a lot of Congress people and senators will get exposed. And so the emoluments clause is no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall without consent of Congress accept of any present emolument office or title of any kind whatsoever from a king, prince, or foreign state. Um, now what that means or what the, what the, uh, the spirit of that means is that, uh, she believes and a lot of people do that she, that he's using the presidential office to profit. Remember, he sent Ivanka Trump over to China for her personal brand, and they made a lot of money off of that. He just dropped his business interest into his son's hands, which is like uh, it's still the Trump business, and he's still going to make money off of that. Um, there are people who believe that he is taking money. So here's an example. So. This is according to Washington Post. The logic that is being used uh, and the logic in the clause prohibits Trump, Trump from taking money at all from a foreign state. To them, the clause prohibits not just straight up gifts, but also payments for services rendered. So it would, be prohibit, so it would prohibit a Trump-owned hotel from renting a ballroom to a foreign embassy and prohibit Trump Tower from renting out office space as it already does to a straight state controlled Chinese bank. So that has happened right now. And there has been plenty of complaints, you know, for things like that that Trump has done. Uh, and so if you are ever going to make an argument to impeach Trump, now personally, I don't like a Mike, the idea of a Mike Pence at all, whatsoever. So even though I personally don't agree, I can say that if Ocasio was quote unquote bought and sold, if she was co-opted by the establishment, why wouldn't she just talk about Russia, 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 Why not? Well, because she doesn't believe in it. But she does believe in rule of law, which I can respect. Strategically, I would not impeach Trump. Strategically, she probably knows that she cannot impeach Trump, honestly. But 
if you were going to discuss an impeachment process, then uh, that would be the process you want to discuss. But she didn't. She's never said that she was going to pr- like push for his impeachment. She just said I would support it under this condition, and that was the that was the only condition that she listed. Now, one thing I believe that she faltered at was saying that no matter who gets the Democratic primary, uh, like no matter who wins, that she would back them. Now, what's kind of scary to me, uh, what's kind of scary to me is the fact that the CNN host was like, well, what if it's Kirsten Gillibrand or Kamala Harris or uh, Senator Warren? And I was like, Really? So we're just not going to say Bernie Sanders? So we're not going to say Tulsi Gabbard? These progressives that could very well... No, the only one, only two that had even have a chance to be Trump would be Bernie Sanders. The only one who would have a fighting chance next would be Tulsi Gabbard. And I would even argue that there is a legitimate argument that if got if she got past the primary election then she would be a better, there would be a better opportunity for her to beat Trump and, and, and maintain office for eight years than Bernie Sanders. So, they purposely only said those names. And she said, how can I, she did say that she doesn't even know who she would support. And because she doesn't know who she would support, they said, wouldn't that be a problem for your party? Wouldn't that be a problem for your, well, well, Okay, so if you don't know who you're going to support there, what about what about the uh, Andrew uh, Andrew Andrew Cuomo and uh, Cynthia Nixon election in New York for governor? Well, who who do you back? Who do you endorse? And she explained exactly why she would endorse Cynthia Nixon. Uh, but you hear what I'm saying, right? If she is on their team, why berate bar- her with these? these questions where they're essentially trying to force her to reveal that she's not going to toe the establishment narrative and therefore Democrats should not trust her. They even asked her the question, when you get in office, what what would you say? If I am, if I am you, or you are like, you win, which is likely that you will, if when I win, I'm going to do this. And they were trying to get her. To, I know what they were trying to do. They were trying to get her to to essentially fall for the trap. Because like democratic socialism is viewed by establishment, baby boomers, and 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 the the more center right Democrats as being communism, evil communism. Ah, ah, ah. But she didn't. She said, I'm going to have, she wants to establish a progressive caucus. She wants to help more progressives win. And she wants to bring in more progressive policies. Which is dope. She handled it very well. And if you look at her interviews, she's handled all of her interviews very well. She even got the view. She said what progress, excuse me, uh, she said what democratic socialism is on the view and they just jumped for joy, people. Jumped for joy. Like screaming at the top of their lungs in the crowd. <laughs> now, how do we know she's a problem for the establishment? Well, like I just said, there's that. But it's not only the left-wing establishment that, that's trying to pose problems for her campaign, but it's also the establishment right. It really is. Ben Shapiro goes on uh, with Fox News. He went on Fox News and <laughs> the dude doesn't even acknowledge her name. He calls her that person. Then at one point called her Sanchez. Just the utter level of disrespect that Ben Shapiro showed pissed me off so much. And it's not, you know, it's not unlike 
Ben Shapiro. Cause I don't like him. So I can't say I didn't expect it, <laughs> right? But it was just just utter, utter disrespect. And he goes on, he pontificates about this, uh, all those untenable things that she wants. You know, just it's just that she thinks that we have the money for them, and nobody has any idea how to pay for them. Oh my God, it's just not possible. Uh, like, okay, Ben. It's weird how you talk about what's not able to be paid for, but you have nothing to say whenever we fund a $700 billion military budget. Like, really? We don't have any money to pay for single-payer health care. We don't have any money to pay for public, for, for, for education, for universities, for public universities. We don't have any money to pay for any type of maternity leave or paternity leave. But we have $700 billion of which 98% of that <clears throat> doesn't even go to taking care of soldiers and even less goes to taking care of veterans. Actually, no, for military budget, none of it goes to taking care of veterans. That's taken care of with a separate budget. It's the same budget that is uh, used for federal jobs. So, you have to forgive me whenever I say that I'm going to be using the phrase Ben Shapiro anytime I want to say that somebody is bullshitting. That's a load of Ben Shapiro right there. That's what that is. Because he's intellectually dishonest. And then Breitbart. Can't really say I'm surprised by that either. But but Breitbart then goes on to say that uh, Ocasio, you know, she's not really from the Bronx. She's not really this person that she proclaims herself to be. Even though she never said she was dirt poor. Although she's not really rich. Her dad was did well for himself at one point and then um, unfortunately passed away around the recession. So they, they conveniently leave that part out though. But Braybart goes on. Westchester has an average home price of $4 million per home. Oh, and by the way, they also have one of the most expensive property tax in the country. She not really from the Bronx. Oh my God. Mind you, people, regionally, any New Yorker would tell you Westchester is like right around the corner from the Bronx. Whenever people from the Bronx want to take their kids to a better school, uh, whenever they get even a, a little bit of money, enough to even rent out a house, they tend to move to Westchester and they still like do most of their interact have most of their interactions outside of school in the Bronx. It's not uncommon. But also all of her family still stays in the Bronx. She used to commute back and forth between the Bronx and Westchester regularly. She lived in the Bronx for her entire adult life after college at Boston College. Oh, by the way, somebody from Barry Bar also said that she was going she went to, she graduated from Ivy League school. Like, I guess their logic is because Ocasio is seen as being one of us, an average human being, which she is. Um, you know, she does extraordinary things, but she's very average as far as her life and background and hell. And even really the fact that she was a, able to help her mom keep that home. It's only, like I said, modest three bedroom home that was bought 10 years ago before the recession. Um, that's an extraordinary thing, but it was still done by a very normal person. No different than you or I. And they're trying to say that that's her sales point. I guess that's what they're trying to do. Mind you, people. Mind you. This is the same Breitbart that ignores the fact that Donald Trump literally inherited 
his millions, but pretends to be about the people, wants to make America great again. Donald Trump doesn't even know the America that he's trying to make great again. He's never been where you or I have been at. He's never seen the things that you or I have seen, nor has he ever experienced the turmoil, the trials, the tribulation of that you or I have seen. When we had our recession, yeah, he lost some money. He was still a billionaire. All his friends were still billionaires and millionaires also. It's a little bit different. But he pretends to be one of us and people really think that he has a secret plan. I'm not, I'm not saying that Trump is 100% with the establishment, but I am saying that he is not one of us. You see, his tax, his tax bill was not for us. It wasn't. Even Republicans came out and said this. Like, Republican talking heads said this. Not the ones who were bought off, but like the Bray Barts and even some of the Fox News people. Uh, not, well, not Bray Bart. Some of the Fox News people, not Bray Bart. But they were, Fox Business was like, yeah, this is not for working class citizens. And there's no, there's not even any guarantee that this, the few benefits that are there for poor people will even exist next year. It's going to be revoted on. But all the benefits for rich people are definitely in the bag. So the same people who are saying that Donald Trump, or who ignore, Donald Trump literally got rich off of screwing people over with multiple bankruptcies because he knew, yeah, I can keep the cash. Let's bankrupt my assets. Yeah, these people will lose jobs. These people will lose jobs. I keep my cash but I know how to run great businesses. What was it in Ireland? Same thing. In Puerto Rico, right now, my man owes like 40 million in back taxes. Yeah, Donald Trump for the people, right? Nobody goes into, nobody on the right, nobody at Breitbart goes into doing that type of research. But back taxes. That's not, that's like when you owe 40 million to your country and to, or to any city or state in that country, how are you going to pretend to be like you're for the people? That's my opinion. But it's even more disgusting to see people like they're attacking her because she's progressive. Uh, and you can even argue because of just how Breitbart is, the, the vitriol that comes out of there, a lot of it racist. You know, with with headlines. Well, you know, Ben Shapiro used to work for Breitbart. Um, but he even had headlines. His most recent headline, Black Man Shreds Colin Kaepernick. What? What does it matter if he's black? What does that mean? Like, why would you make that? Why don't you just say his, his name? Because they want you to say, oh, look, the black person agrees with us. That's called identity politics, the same identity politics that he supposedly hates, right? Hmm, <laughs> interesting. Breitbart does a lot of that type of behavior, too, even though Ben Shapiro left. Ben Shapiro only left because they, uh... oh, yeah, they were, like, riding the Trump wave and Ben Shapiro was not... And so he had to part ways with them. But my point is Ocasio's family at some point after hard work, not inheritance, because the zip code doesn't matter. And the fact that her dad was able to go back, get his degree, become an architect and then move up in society. And after he passed, Ocasio and her mother took on the mantle to, to try and somehow make ends meet to help keep that home. And then for Ocasio to move back to the Bronx, work in the city, activate, you know, do political activism for the city. How the hell can you legitimately attack that? What is the standard at that point? 
These are hypocrites. So if you're not putting your ear to the street, so to speak, if you're not talking to these activists, if you don't do any research, if you don't even bother to co- like to to call her campaign or email her, and this goes for progressives too, and these neolist, self-defeatist bullshitters who just want to see the world burn because they're perfectly comfortable with where they're at, you know, screw where everybody else is, then hey, if you're one of those people, do what you gotta do, man. But just don't, don't, don't bring down your allies. Don't bring down our allies. Don't, don't interrupt good work being done. That's how I feel. Don't, 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 don't interrupt good work being done. Period. Point blank. Oh, man. We'll be back after a short break. Right people, um, we're back, and uh, some crazy stuff has come down the pipe about North Korea. <laughs> I covered it last night too on my my YouTube channel. Definitely go check it out if you have not. <laughs> but believe it or not, somehow, some way, retroactively. We found out that North Korea has been secretly, secretly having secret sites that were secret from everybody, including the United States, secretly, but too secret to talk about, or excuse me, not too secret to talk about with NBC apparently, but too secret to talk about with the president of the United States when he's about to sign an agreement with North Korea. Because according to NBC and according to five unknown sources, because they've been so reliable in the past as of late, right? (sighs) Yeah, according to them, there is absolutely, probably, maybe some secret sites have nuclear, um, what it? they said nuclear enriched uranium sites. That whenever Trump started talking about this, what, two months ago? Two months ago. Maybe even longer at this point. Maybe even three months. They didn't, they, they apparently knew that supposedly... Kim Jong-un was lying and he had no intention on uh, getting these weapons, getting this uh, nuclear or revealing these nuclear sites in case we come to expect. He was never going to talk about them during the acts of diplomacy between uh, North Korea and South Korea and, and President Trump in North Korea. He was never going to talk about it, apparently. Except, I am not, am, no, hell. No, 
This is that Ben Shapiro I'll be talking about, people. It's that BS. Because, first of all, when's the last time some unnamed sources from the intelligence community, when's the last time some unnamed sources said something like this and Donald Trump's name was involved and the neoliberals were all against whatever was being whatever was happening at the time namely the 2016 election and i even believe that nbc was the one who broke the these two unnamed uh, intelligence agents two unnamed intelligence agents new york times broke the 17 intelligence agencies all agree that russia hacked the election in favor of Donald J. Trump. Do y'all remember what happened very shortly after that? I do. I remember that in what, July? Was it July 2017? No, 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 I lied. Oh, actually, I think it was July. If it was not July, it was August. The New York Times had to retract that article if you all don't remember. Yeah. They're still using that, by the way, to justify that article, that intel, quote unquote, was used to justify the Mueller investigation to begin with. That article was retracted. CNN executives got caught on camera saying that the Russia story was BS. It was for ratings. That's it. That's all it's ever been about for them. Which I don't think anybody was surprised about. CNN then later had to retract the story. In fact, I'm gonna see if I can find the website that talks about all the retracted Russia stories because these are the same people who are telling us that we should blindly give in to authority just because it's part of the alphabet soup that is the U.S. intelligence agency, you know, NSA, FBI, CIA, alphabet, I call it alphabet soup. Um, but, give me a second, we're gonna see if we can find it, so. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Come on, where is that? This is like so this is a good article. This is done by the nation. I just for all you know I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the nation is a little bit more conservative, so I just want to you know, give you all a little heads up. So, uh, this is the, the article. In her new campaign memoir, What Happened? Hillary Clinton reveals that she has followed every twist and turn of the story and read everything I could get my hands on concerning Russia's role in 2016 presidential election. I do wonder sometimes, this is a quote, I do wonder sometimes about what would have happened President Obama had made a televised address to the nation the fall of 2016, warning that our democracy was under attack. Now, people, I don't know if y'all remember in the fall of 2016, like I remember it, but Obama did address that. He did. He actually did go on. <laughs> Bruh, it's not under attack, by the way, if Israel donates money to both Hillary Clinton and have APAC legally influencing our elections. It is not under attack when Saudi Arabia donates money to campaigns and lobbyists, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just look the other way whenever they start bombing Yemen. No, couldn't be that. It's not under attack when the Ukraine attacks, you know, donates. And it's under attack when Hillary Clinton, who is whose Clinton Foundation is under investigation and was during the election for that very same thing. 
Um, it's under attack whenever she's taking money from damn near every single Western industrialized and even Eastern Europe and even uh, uh, yeah Eastern European and even some Middle Eastern oligarchs for favors. That's that's not an attack on our democracy. Just this fake story. But anyway, Clinton has had a lot to take in since the election. The controversy over alleged meddling, a Russian meddling in Trump campaign collusion has consumed Washington and the national media. Yet nearly one year later, there is still no concrete evidence of its central allegations. There are claims by the US intelli- by US intelligence officials that Russian government hacked emails and used social media to help elect Donald Trump, but there is yet to be any cooperation. Although the oft-cited January intelligence report uses the strongest language and offers the most detailed assessment yet, the Atlantic observed that it does not, nor can it, uh, provide evidence for its assertions. So they pretty much wrote a fake story is what they're saying. Noting the absence of proof and hard evidence to back up the agency's uh, claims that the Russia, a Russian government engineered the election attack. It does claim that in that Atlanta article. The New York Times concluded that the intelligence communities, uh, the intelligence community's message essentially amounts to trust us. And that still remains the case, which I just talked about, which is freaking hilarious. Let's continue. <laughs> the same holds for the questions of collusion officials acknowledged to Rut- Rutters. Uh, I always hope I pronounce that right. Is it Rutters or Rooters? Or Rayuters? <laughs> anyway. Um, in May. That they had not seen any evidence of wrongdoing or collusion between the campaign and Russia and communications reviewed so far. Well-placed critics of Trump, including former DNI chief James Clapper, former CIA director Michael Morrow, uh, Representative Maxine Waters, and Senator Dianne Feinstein concur to date. Recognizing this absence of evidence helps examine what has been substituted in its place. Shattered, the insider account of the Clinton campaign reports that in the days after the election, Hillary Clinton, Hillary declined to take responsibility for her own loss. Instead, one source recounted aides were ordered to make sure all these narratives get spun the right way. Within 24 hours of Clinton's concession speech, top officials gathered to engineer the case that the election wasn't entirely, entirely on the up and up. Already, in Russian, ha- Russian hacking, was a counterpiece of the argument, or centerpiece, excuse me, of the argument. Now, I do want to make sure that you all understand something. They did do that, remember? They, and the intelligence agencies and the clappers of the world backed that. But what's hilarious about that is that Jill Stein said, okay, Hillary, I'll take the bait. Let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's see what we get back. We, can, we should audit the elections. We should see who voted for who. Oh, hold on. Wait a minute. Uh, yeah. Don't want to, uh, don't want to do that. Why not? Let's do it. Come on. Michigan, find out who benefited from all the rigging. <laughs> Hillary. Wisconsin, found out who benefited from all the rigging again. Hillary. You want to go to Pennsylvania? No. Let's, God, please stop it. Please stop exposing me. So they ended that. But this focus on Russia has utility far beyond the Clinton camp. It dove tails with elements of state power that oppose Trump's call for improved relations with Moscow and who are willing to deploy a familiar playbook of the Cold War fear-mongering to block any developments on that front. Now, I want you all to think about something because this is a very well-put-together piece. Very, in my opinion, even though the Nathan nation, I think, can be somewhat conservative, this, if you replace Moscow with Pyongyang and, uh, yeah, it literally sounds the same, right? So, it, we're going to reset that sentence. <laughs> it dovetails with elements of state power that oppose Trump's call for improved relations with Pyongyang and who are willing to deploy a familiar playbook of the Cold War, because North Korea... Uh, did happen during that era 
fear mongering to block any developments on that front. Hmm. Interesting. So you're telling me that it's a good possibility? That it's a really good possibility? That they're trying again? They're, they're, they're using the same tactics that they use for Russia. They're using the same tactics that they use for Syria. And people are probably going to bite, but whatever. The multiple investigations and anonymous leaks are also a tool to pacify an erratic president whose anti-interventionist rhetoric, by all indications, a ruse, uh, alarmed the foreign policy elites during the campaign. Corporate media outlets driven by clicks and ratings are inoxor, inexor, in, ill, good God, in, <laughs> inexorably, inexorably drawn uh, to the scandal. The public is presented with a real life spy thriller, which for some carries the added appeal of possibly undoing a reviled president and his improbable victory. So, um, I do want to try to find that article that talks about the retractions. Because we got to remember these things because people forget. <clears throat> this is for the con Consortorium News. Exclusive. A founding Russiagate myth is that all 17 U.S. intelligence agencies agreed that the Russian, Russian hacking happened in the distribution of Democratic emails, a falsehood that the New York Times has belatedly retracted. And this is by uh, Robert Perry. Oh, I was right. It was in July. No, excuse me. It happened in June and into July. It was updated last in July. I'm good when it comes to stuff like that. Not good with names, though. I really suck at that. But I am good when it comes to other stuff. <laughs> uh, hold on, let me do some water, peeps. Mm. I've been on this water drinking kick recently. I've grown an appreciation for it, considering that our water is literally being attacked at every single minute. Nestle. I feel bad for the people out in uh, California. Getting fukushima <laughs> Getting fukushima Dead fish and radiate, radioactive Pacific Ocean. And, oh, God, man. It's bad. So make sure you take the time to appreciate your water, people. Because who knows how long it's going to be until that's kill killing us. Well, unless you are living places like some places in New York, I know some places in Florida, obviously Flint, Mi Michigan, California has two problems. Their water is being poisoned and they they have regular droughts. So, yeah, that sucks. Mm. But let's continue. The New York Times has finally admitted that one of the favorite Russiagate canards uh, that all 17 U.S. intelligence agencies concurred on the assessment of Russian hacking of Democratic emails is false. On Thursday, the Times appended uh, a correction to the June 25th article that had repeated the false claim which has been used by Democrats and the mainstream media for months to brush aside any doubts uh, about the foundation of Russiagate scandal. Oh, excuse me, about the foundation of the Russiagate scandal and portray President Trump as delusional for doubting what all 17 intelligence agencies supposedly knew to be true. <clears throat> In the Times, White House memo of uh, June 25th, correspondent Maggie Haberman mocked Trump, still refusing to acknowledge a basic fact agreed upon by 17 
14 American intelligence agencies that he now oversees. Russia orchestrated the attacks and did it to help get him elected. She's probably had a really awkward year since that retraction. <laughs> Woo! Sorry. <laughs> However, on Thursday, the Times, while leaving most of Haberman's ridicule of Trump in place, noted in the correction that the relevant intelligence assessment was made by four intelligence agencies, the Office of Director of Inspect uh, of National Intelligence, excuse me, Central Intelligence, so CIA, DNI, uh, which, by the way, I believe the, that the person who was in charge of DNI at the time was Clapper. <laughs> so, yeah. The CIA, FBI, who we now know was ran by James freaking Comey, and then later on, or at one point, acting as leader was Andrew McCabe, who was also corrupt and had senior officials like Peter Sturzok, who was also corrupt, and Lisa Page, who was a senior official as well, who was also corrupt, and a bunch of other people who've all been called corrupt. So, but that's neither here nor there, right? So the CIA, who had a vested interest in making sure that we maintain negative relations with uh, uh, with Russia, uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which was ran by, I believe, James Clapper at the time, the FBI, who was ran by James Comey, who is a disgrace, and the NSA. The assessment was not approved by all 17 organizations. <laughs> It should say at the end of that, only the ones co-opted by the Clinton Mafia. The Times grudging correction was vindication for some Russiagate skeptics who had questioned the claim on a full-scale intelligence assessment, which usually would take the form of the National Intelligence Estimate, or NIE, a product that seeks out the views of the entire intelligence community and includes dissents. That was something new for me. I didn't know that. Uh, the reality of a more narrowly based Russiagate assessment was admitted in May by President Obama's national uh, director of national intelligence, James Crack. Ah, ha ah, ha! I was right. So, and oh, by the way, so James Clapper, corrupt as shit. You all know that by now, right? John Brennan, literally, is in charge of an information or or. A disinformation campaign as we speak. John Brennan, former director of the CIA, so also part of the Clinton Mafia, who is just looking to collect that that paycheck uh, that you get whenever you have you know all these defense contracts out. Uh, Clapper. Clapper testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on May 8th that Russia, the Russian hacking claim came from a Special Intelligence Community Assessment, or ICA, uh, produced by select analysts from the CIA, <laughs> the NSA, and the FBI. Oh, all of the ones sworn in, where the leaders were sworn in by Obama. Hmm. Interesting. Clapper further acknowledged that the analysts who produced the January 6th assessment on alleged Russian hacking were handpicked by the CIA, of course, the FBI, of course, and the NSA. Yet, as any intelligence expert would tell you, if you handpick analysts, you are really handpicking the conclusion. For instance, if the analysts were known to be hardliners on Russia or supporters of Clinton, they could probably be expected to deliver a one-sided report. And they did. Right? We know that now. So, this type of logic, these type of tactics are being used 
once again, once again, to force us to believe or to try and convince us, I would say, I'm pretty sure that most of us are pretty wise to this bullshit by now, or this, sorry, this Ben Shapiro. <laughs> most of us are pretty wise to this Ben Shapiro nonsense by this point, but they're still trying to push the same tactics because what I always tell y'all people, what is my motto? These politicians, these intelligence communities, they're not really intelligent. They're not really intelligent. They just are corrupt enough to get them to the right places by creating the right network of also corrupt people. Don't have to be smart. Just have to be corrupt and have a way to control the flow of money. So, here's what's interesting about this. So, the CIA was included in that last report, right? When we're talking about Russiagate. Which it should have been, of course. If you're going to make a claim such as that, it has to be. But here's what's interesting about this one. They just say five intelligence f- officials. That's what NBC said. Five intelligence officials. Guess who decided that it didn't want to comment Donald Trump's uh, Donald Trump's appointed CIA why is that important because remember like I said you have some one sidedness that goes on whenever everybody in that by the way I'm a firm believer that any director of any major organization so Directors of CIA, directors of FBI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I believe that those positions should be campaigning positions. Those should be on national ballots because we want to know what you plan on doing, and if it is anything other than promoting the welfare of peace and prosperity for this country and others that are involved with us. If it is anything other than we want to talk to our enemies, if they, if, if they are reachable and communicate so that we can create peace in the region, if it is anything other than we want to remove, you know, we want to stop regime change, then you shouldn't win. I think that Supreme Court justices should be like every other federal, excuse me, every other seat uh, or every other judge seat judgeship in the country that isn't a, a federal judgeship even though even US attorneys US or excuse me federal judges should be appointed also by the people if you are going to affect the outcome of every single person in this country and Supreme Court judges do do that and FBI directors do do that. CIA does this. Then, don't you think it would be, maybe, just a little important to make sure that we had more input than allowing the people who were selected under elections that were once upon a time decided by whoever spent 90, it was the person who raised the most money 97% of the time. During a Citizens United list era. So, my point is, is that the NBC refuses to say exactly who the person in charge is. Like, who is the person that is going to make these decisions? Who is the intelligence agency who who signed off on this belief? Who is the intelligence agency 
or which is the intelligence agency that said it was okay to go to the media. And better yet, if this is true, why won't the CIA cooperate it? Maybe because they work for Trump. A little bit different. Right? Maybe it's because it's a strong possibility that if you know anybody who has logic and reasoning skills, luckily you might not have to have logic and reasoning skills. You can just reach out to me, watch my show, what you should do here and on YouTube, and on Facebook, on Twitter. <laughs> um, maybe it's because. the CIA doesn't won't corroborate the story maybe it's because they know as well as I do as well as you do that if they come out and say the CIA agrees with this, who appointed the CIA director? Trump did. If they come out and say the FBI 100% agrees with this and they go to Chris Ray, they're not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Look at every single corrupt intelligence officer who is sitting in front of Congress or the Senate Judiciary Committee right now being probed. You want to end up like what? You want to end up like Comey? You want to end up like Andrew McCabe? You want to lose your retirement right before you get it? <laughs> uh, normally, I wouldn't laugh at people for something like that, but oh, screw that guy, right? He's corrupt as shit. He didn't have a problem. He didn't have a problem corrupting our elections. Did he? So clearly, I would say that this is probably a victory. It's probably a victory for Trump. I know it sounds weird. I really hope that he doesn't fall for this, but I would say that it's a victory for Trump because of the fact that so many people really say that he's 100% with the establishment or some some people say that he's 100% not with the establishment but clearly in my opinion the fact that this happens right as they're about to close a hard deal with North Korea it happens right after all the war profiteering stocks drop to a Super low over the last was low. The lowest has been over like the last two years or three years. Um, the Democrats then passed legislation to try and prevent the North Korea deal. In case you did not know, that happened. So that means that MAGA people are good this time. Y'all are y'all can y'all can celebrate loudly and and you can know that. The North Korea deal, the North Korea peace treaty was actually a legitimate treaty. It was not a treaty that was something that was, you know, made <clears throat> because a lot of people were saying, well, if if North Korea agreed, then that must mean it's a deep state deal. Or excuse me, not North Korea. That if if the the if the establishment was going to agree going to go with this that it was a deep state deal and we we're going to try to regime change them however they haven't gone with it stocks dropped when that deal was made um not only did stocks drop but also the the uh Establishment started pa passing legislation almost immediately to try to stop it. The fear mongering started. Rachel Maddow with her conspiracy theories, right? I don't know if y'all remember that. She said that they have this little two mile border on Russia, and so he's doing this to benefit Russia. 
<laughs> Hoo wee. Rachel Maddow never stops impressing me with her, her beautiful logic. So, I do want to talk really quick before we finish up. Hold on. Boom, I had to pull this up. So yeah, I do want to talk really quick before we bring this up, before we uh, finish up, about the recent situation in Iran. So most of you may not know a lot of history about Iran, so I do want to give a brief overview before we go into it. In 1951, Mohammed Mosaddegh, he was the president of Iran, duly elected. He wasn't quote unquote progressive, but he was trying to take uh, Iran towards a more secular direction, which we know what that translates to in the United States logic, which is like, oh, if you're secular, that means you're going to be not in our control and you're not going to rule with autocratic, theocratic, you know, like you're just not going to do what we tell you to do, which is true. Look at Syria, right? So, what did they do? They deployed what was it has been come to be known as the Madman Mosaddegh tactic. It was used by the CIA. They called Mosaddegh. It's 1951, people. They called him a communist. He said he was in Stalin's pockets. They, the CIA knew that he wasn't a communist. But it didn't matter. To employ this madman Mosaddegh tactic, the same way that we saw them do with Assad, the same way that we have seen them do with even Putin to a degree, the same way that we have seen them do with Trump, even though Trump kind of helps that part out himself, but the same way they remember they call him crazy old Bernie. Uh, it, it's the CIA has always co-opted media. They bought up journalists. They bought up military officers, and they even paid off extremist war the extremist warriors of Islam. Funny enough, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, was part of that, and I'll go into that a little bit later. This man, Mosaddegh, was so influential in the region. He was a 1951 Time Magazine Man of the Year. But Mosaddegh had one big problem on his hand. Mosaddegh wanted to nationalize the oil supply. Mosaddegh was about to take power out of the hands of Iran, or excuse me, out of the hands of the United States in the greater Persia at the time. And put it in the hands of the people. That that don't flow well with the US. Y'all know that, right? We know how that story goes. And you gotta remember too, this is during the ramping up of the Cold War in Iran, last time I checked has a huge, shares a massive border with Russia. So they painted Mosaddegh as a communist. They said he was a dictator. And then after uh, they paid some terrorists to overthrow him, they arrested him for treason. Luckily he escaped, but yeah, that was a lie. One of the headlines from that time period legitimately read, Iranian oil may again flow westward. The press also referred to him as a, as the one-time dictator, whenever they would speak about him in the past tense. The one-time dictator, Mosaddegh, he was an elected president. The dictator, who was Polovi, he was like the, the Shah, I believe, at the time. He worked with the United States to make that happen. 
Iran used to be, believe it or not, before Israel came into its own, because Israel was a baby at that time, if even. Iran was the biggest ally in the United in uh, in the Middle East for the United States. And what we did was we gave them guns and they made sure that oil kept flowing into the U.S. and to the West. Some of you may be curious if this has anything to do with Saudi Arabia. And I want to give you the exact time frame. Because if I recall, it does. When it comes to these, the, the sensitivity of getting the time accurate, I like to get that right. Because like the establishment of Israel, the... the um, the establishment of the EU and the way they granted the, the preferential treatment they they used in gathering and allowing countries from Eastern Europe into the EU, like all that stuff, like all that stuff is super important when you're talking about the time period. So, oh, and Come on. Oh, fun fact, I didn't know that uh ten percent of Saudi Arabians are Afro Arabic. So the Saudi Arabian Kingdom was founded in 1932. Now here's where it gets crazy. It was it was admitted into the United Nations in 1945. Okay, but it's hmm, give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Damn it, I cannot find it. Sorry, I'm trying to find out. So even though the kingdom was founded in 1932, it was nowhere near what it is right now. Um, essentially, Saudi Arabia was... Come on, come on. Hey, anybody want to uh, <laughs> anybody want to get a visa to go to Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Any of my ladies out there? Just please, God, don't dance in the streets. Ugh, where is it at? I know I just saw it. Sorry. Um, I like learning stuff with y'all too. Sometimes it's cool to learn stuff like. I like being surprised whenever we learn some stuff together. Uh, it's pretty dope. So I don't have a problem like looking up stuff whenever we're on the show together because I feel like it's good to to have you all research and I can research at the same time. And a lot of the times, especially if you're on my live streams, we uh, teach each other. They A lot of my people will actively research with me. A lot of supporters will. So it's pretty dope. But this I actually had up and I accidentally exited out. So <laughs> my bad piece, my bad. Uh, okay, this should help. So essentially, in case you didn't know, and this is relevant to the Iran situation, I'm explaining how in a second. So the British strategy of colonial divide and rule and reliance on Muslim forces to promote imperial interests reached its apogee. I hope I said that right. Apogee in the Middle East. Um. During, during and after the First World War, the carving up of the region by British and French officials has been endlessly commented on, though less so 
uh, as an illustration of the long-standing British use of Islam, which then took a new term. Now, I'm explain why that's important too. The Middle East was seen by British planners as critical for both strategic and commercial reasons. Strategically, the Islamic territories were important buffers against Russian expansion into the imperial lands. Uh, and the route from British India to uh, the British controlled at the time, Egypt. But oil had by now also entered into the picture. Ding, ding, ding. With the founding of the Anglo-Iranian Oil, Cumper, uh, oil Cumper, uh, Cumper, Corporation in Persia in 1908, the discovery of oil in Iraq soon after and its increasingly important role in powering military during the First World War, British planners viewed overall control of Iraqi and Persian oil, which, for those of you who don't know by now, that would be today Iranian oil to be a first-class British war aim. Sir Maurice Hankey, Secretary of the War Cabinet, said towards the end of the conflict by 1918, the general staff of Baghdad wrote that the future power in the world is oil. People, how many times have I talked about why Israel was established? Right around the time that Russia ended up, because obviously they border the Middle East, but Russia also got all the Eastern, all of Eastern Europe, which it would be like actual Europe at the time, Western Europe, that was their access into the Middle East. So USSR actually had the only two interests, like which means no bases, right? That's important. No bases. You can't put a base in Turkey like you do, like you have right now. Nowhere to launch from. If there was a full scale attack, so and we had to give them Eastern Europe, right? Because they, they pretty much took all the heat for the war. It was really Russia while we won. So, here's some information a lot of you all might not know. British foreign policy had, since the 16th century, supported the Ottoman Empire of the Muslim Turks, the largest and most powerful Muslim entity in the world, which, at its height of the 17th century, had spanned North Africa, Southeast Europe, and much of the Middle East. Britain was committed to defending the Ottoman integrity against Russian and French imperial designs, um, which involved the de facto support for the Turkish Caliphate. The Ottoman Sultan's claim to be the leader of Ummah, the Muslim world community. Uh, after Britain captured India, the Ottoman Empire was seen as a convenient buffer to keep out rivals along the military and trade routes. The crown jewel, uh, or excuse me, in the jewel of the crown. London often cast itself as the savior of the Turkish Sultan in the uh, Crimean War of 1854, which is one of the bloodiest conflicts in the European history. British and France fought on behalf of the Ottomans against Russia. So there's like a huge historic, like, we're going to use the Ottoman Empire to protect whatever we have to uh, against Russia. So obviously, we know later that uh, the Ottoman Empire, after it got broken up, was divided amongst, what, the European superpowers. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. Come on, where you at, where you at? Come on, where you at? Oh. So essentially, this is probably the important part. The new state of Saudi Arabia, its regional authority underpinned by a religious fundamentalism, gave Britain a foothold in the heart of the Islamic world in Mecca and Medina. Now, I always talk about this because it's super important. Understanding that that is exactly why they put like America didn't develop the strategy. We're literally using the same strategy that Great Britain is used. In fact, in almost every 
to my knowledge, in every regime change that America has taken part in, Great Britain has almost mirrored it and it's helped us support it. So, and they always replace, think about this, every single time we've quote unquote gotten rid of a dictator and instituted a regime change, a hyper-religious fundamentalist takes over because in Islam and the Old Testament, they always tell you this thing, what blind faith, just believe me. Now here's what's interesting about Christianity is that Jesus was the total opposite. Jesus is like, show and prove. Oh, you don't believe I'm the son of God? Son of God? Watch me turn this water into wine, bitch. Cool. You said you need some bread? Gotcha. Watch me rise after three days. Believe me now. Jesus in Christianity is about show and prove. However, the Old Testament and Islam and, and even uh, the Torah is about blind faith. Think about that. Which is why whenever someone from, you know, the Southern Baptist world, what do they quote? To you whenever they're trying to tell you what you're not allowed to do Old Testament the same testament that's used for the Quran uh, or at least that's the basis of the Quran same testament that is the Torah so think about that more broadly Britain had succeeded in achieving its goal of dividing the Middle East and a ring of client states out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire the Gulf states ringing Saudi Arabia in Aden, Bahrain, and Oman were all feudal regimes underpinned by Britain military protection. Meanwhile, Britain continued to exploit its other clients. Faisal, who with, who with allies had captured Damascus, Syria, in 1918. Uh, was made king of Iraq in 1921 and Abdullah Sharif Hus uh, Sharif Hussein's uh, other son was dubbed king of Transjordan which became independent under British protection finally there was Palestine which had also been captured by British for forces to the, towards the end of the war here however Britain was committed to creating what Foreign Secretary Arthur Belfort outlined in 1917 as a national home for the Jews um, in 1920, uh, April 1920, uh, at a conference in the Italian resort of San Remo, or San Remo, the newly formed League of Nations formally handed Britain a man mandate to govern Palestine. So essentially, Palestine was a nation. They were a nation. Balfour had also said that Great Britain needed the Middle East. Uh, in early in in the early years of the 20th century, for supreme economic and political control to be exercised, and in a friendly, unostentatious cooperation with the Arabs, but nevertheless, in the last resort, to be exercised, the regimes that Britain cr had created were puppets, es essentially law and order governments, allied mainly with the traditional ruling classes of Islam. It, in turn, these favored sultans, emirs, or monarchs saw British rule as providing protection against the dangers of instability or emancipatory nationalist uh, movements that had begun to stir, most notably at the time, during or in Iraq. So now you know. Persia, what is now known as Iran, was in Britain's back pocket. Saudi Arabia, obviously, is still in Britain's back pocket. Now, why is that important? Palestine was in Britain's back pocket, which is one of the, re like, what is, like, they, they just said they used those, those, those powers or those leaderships, the leadership that they kept in power. What were they used for? They were literally there to keep people docile and make sure that the region was taken care of for Britain's use. Uh, so you can just replace Britain with Western use because once again, the United States and uh, and Great Britain pretty much partake in all of the same regime change um, action. So think about Israel. Think about Israel. There's Great Britain is still really in charge of that, or the West is still really in charge of that area. And what do they do? They keep the Palestinians docile. 
Isn't that what they do? Who's their biggest enemy? We believe that Iran is our biggest enemy. Well, why? The only reason that they would think that is if maybe Iran didn't cooperate with the West like they wanted. And what did Iran want to do? Iran has tried multiple times to nationalize its oil. And every single time that it tries, the West interferes. Most notably, 1951 with Mosaddegh. Uh, recently, they had a, they staged like a little protest in 2009. And what, five days ago, well, over the last few days, there's been a bunch of protests, right? Guess who met up in Iran? Oh, actually, no, I lied. They wasn't. They, they didn't meet up in Iran. They met up in Jordan, I believe. Crown Prince, soon to be king of Saudi Arabia, Jared Kushner. Yeah, you know it's going to be great if Jared Kushner meets up. Netanyahu, who is supposedly so fearful. He's so fearful of those Arabs. The leader of Jordan. And uh, Netanyahu's Prime Minister of Transportation. They met up to talk about a railroad track that will essentially take oil from Iran, or excuse me, not Iran, I apologize. That will take oil from Israel, or at least they'll be able to take it from Saudi Arabia into Israel, um, bypass Damascus and Syria. But it would not, however, be able to avoid Iran. So you think that this recent unrest, the constant sanctions to in the in the pulling out the pulling out of the Iran deal because it doesn't matter that's why I was telling you Iran deal is bullshit last year they put a satellite in the sky and they said it violated the the, the Iran nuclear deal it the the deal was about the deal was a people the deal was about nuclear weapons and uranium enrichment that was it and yet hey We're supposed to have you all believe that they're crazy. Right? That those are those are just insane Muslims who who have always been the enemy of the United States, used to be our biggest military ally in in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia didn't really have an army at the time. We used to defend Iran very much like we used to defend uh, Saudi Arabia. Look the other way with Iran, just very much like we look the other way with Saudi Arabia. As long as the regime does what we tell it to. Once that doesn't happen, look at what happened in Libya. Look at what's happening in Syria, which used to belong to Great Britain. Look at what happened in Palestine when those people started stepping out of line. All of a sudden, everybody's a terrorist. We have to keep them down. There, Netanyahu is crazy, right? And he does believe a lot of stuff he says. But also, believe, please believe, he's getting his orders straight from the West. Straight from the West. Everything they say about Palestine not being a country is propaganda. I just read it to you. It was a country. It wasn't the British rule. But guess what? Mozambique. Mozambique we used to be on Porch, Portugal or Portuguese rule. Does that mean it's not a country? I believe it still is a colony for, for under Portugal. The Ivory Coast. Is it not still a country? Does it not still have representation? It does. Does South Africa still not have representation in the, in the United Nations? It does. Saudi Arabia, as corrupt as can be, does it still have representation in the United Nations? Iran has representation in the United Nations. You hear what I'm saying, people. But if you give Palestine representation in the United Nations around the same time that you want to create Israel, then they can fight against it. And the whole world would be watching. And they would have a say in whether or not that was going to be allowed. So 
that's why it's important to make sure that you know your history. Because these Iran protests are not a coincidence. That region has been ruled for quite some time by the West since before World War One. It's important to remember that. So with that being said, people, um, thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Mikasa Sukasa on American Freedom Radio. Make sure that you go and join Justin Form. Uh, join that conversation, man. It's it's we we there's some good stuff. The stuff that people talk about on there, the video that they show, uh, and that you actually get to see them because they're not being suppressed like they are on Facebook. You know, Facebook only shows the videos that it wants to show. I mean, I have I, I follow Lee Camp, I follow Tim Black, those are my friends too. I follow Jimmy Dore, I follow Kokolinsky, I follow a lot of these people. Don't see any of their videos. I know a lot of you all don't see mine either. Despite the fact that we all post pretty regularly. So. Sucks, right? But, not on Just Inform, you will see the videos that you want to see. You will see the friends that you that you uh, want to see. That you signed up for. <laughs> Pages and groups that you liked and that you joined. You'll actually be able to see the activity without it being hidden from you and deleted from you randomly. Promise. All right? Uh, so, yeah, join JustInform.com. Go to MCSC Network. And always remember, more than anything else, find your balance. Peace.